One of the biggest challenges that teachers face is student behaviour. That is, difficult student behaviour. And most student behaviour is annoying rather than dangerous. And it's this behaviour that you deal with day in, day out, and can stretch you to your limits. There are tried and true research-based practices that have been shown over and over to be successful in managing this low-level tricky behaviour. Good teachers use these strategies instinctively and may not be able to articulate it, what it is that they do. And while it may not be rocket science, the complex nature of teaching means that it's not always to be consistent, especially in the face of student behaviour that pushes your buttons. After all, you are human. In this video, you will be reminded of the effective classroom management practices that work, the classroom management practices that you may have forgotten because every year is different and every class is different, and you may need to hone tools that you haven't used for a while. Effective classroom management is about being intentional and purposeful in your words and actions. That is, not leaving classroom behaviour up to chance, but giving yourself and your students the best chance of success by using the strategies that are known to work. I'm Mari Amaro. I'm a teacher, presenter and author, and I've been working with students and teachers for over 30 years. I'm passionate about helping teachers improve teaching and learning practices. I combine research and experience to provide strategies that improve student learning by improving classroom management. I focus on the practices that take little or no extra teacher time, strategies that can actually give you back time by helping you to work more effectively. I love coaching teachers and I emphasise teacher wellbeing because improved teacher wellbeing means improved student wellbeing and that contributes to better academic and social outcomes for all our students. If you'd like to learn more, please subscribe to our channel and ring the bell. We put out two videos every week so make sure you don't miss the content and if you know anyone you believe would benefit from this information, please share it with your colleagues, friends and family. Everyone knows a teacher or someone who works in a school. If you have any questions or topics that you'd like me to cover, please let us know in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. These are the strategies that are research-based and can help you to manage your classroom more effectively. Number one, help students feel connected to school. The Wingspread Declaration on School Connections stated that students have more likelihood of success when they feel connected to school. When students feel that adults in the school care about them as people, as well as about their learning, they're more likely to feel connected to school. The declaration, which was based on a review of research and extensive discussion, found that in order to achieve connection, a school must provide high expectations combined with high levels of support have a focus on positive teacher-student relationships and provide physical and emotional safety. When students are connected to school, academic performance improves, violent and destructive incidents reduce, school attendance improves and more students complete their schooling. If you'd like to learn more about how to create a positive classroom culture for your students, check out our video on how to build a safe, predictable, consistent learning environment for all your students. Number two, be consistent. If you ever ha have had to walk on eggshells around someone because you never knew what to expect, you'll have some idea of the damage it can do to relationships. Your students need to feel safe both physically and emotionally in order to learn. So developing a consistent practice is vital. When I first began teaching, being consistent in managing behaviour was one of my biggest challenges. There were competing demands on my time and energy, colleagues with different standards and values, parents with a range of demands and expectations, and then the wide variety of students from different backgrounds, motivation and challenges. I wasn't really sure what consistency meant. What I know now is that consistency doesn't mean being exactly the same all the time. And nor does it mean being a robot and not reacting to circumstances or showing your real feelings. Consistency does mean, however, that students are fairly certain what they can expect from you. They know, for example, that you won't get angry with them today about something that you laughed at yesterday. They know that if you make a mistake or fail to follow through, 
that you'll apologise and take responsibility. They also know that when they mess up, and they will, that you will treat them with respect while you still hold them accountable and you'll help them to learn from their mistakes. Check out our videos on the importance of being consistent and how you can develop consistency within your teaching practice. Number three, talk less. As a general rule, kids can listen effectively for about half their age in minutes. So for a child of 10, that's about five minutes. For a 15-year-old, that's about seven and a half minutes. Use the schedule for the day and for lessons and stick to it. Give yourself a limited amount of time to talk and then allow students to discuss, to process the information and to engage in learning activities. And mix up the activities in the classroom so that they're talking, writing, moving and listening in a variety of ways. Number four, use positive reinforcement. John Mag, in his article, Rewarded by Punishment, discusses the reluctance in teachers to use positive reinforcement, despite the evidence that it works and is more effective than punishment in managing behaviour. There is a belief that rewards are manipulative and demeaning and that they take away the individual's right to choose their behaviour. Interestingly, the same believers have no problem using punishment and not viewing it as coercive. There are many reasons why teachers tend to underuse positive reinforcement, and research has shown that they tend to focus more on negative behaviours, believing that that's an effective behaviour strategy. But unfortunately, focusing on the negative can create a negative tone in the classroom, and that doesn't contribute a positive re- to positive relationships. It can also have the opposite of the intended purpose, especially for students who are happy for any kind of attention. Positive reinforcement occurs naturally in the classroom, so it makes sense to plan what you're going to re- in, what you're going to reinforce so that you don't inadvertently reinforce negative behaviours. Setting up classroom behave- rewards may seem to take more effort than simply punishing a student because the results are not immediate. However, if you build positive reinforcement into your everyday practice, you'll find that there are many simple ways of giving students positive re- recognition that don't take up much time and energy. Number five, have high expectations for all your students. Your students will live up or down to your expectations and student achievement is strongly affected by what the teacher expects of them. And this has been demonstrated by many educational researchers. The first and most famous experiment is known as the Pygmalion effect. The researchers Robert Rosenthal and Lenore Jacobson conducted an experiment in a primary school where all the students sat an intelligence test. The experimenters then gave the 18 teachers the names of the students who scored in the top 20%, telling them that this meant that they showed exceptional potential and would achieve high results within the year. Unbeknownst to the teachers, these students were randomly selected and the testing showed no such prediction. When all students were tested again eight months later, the so-called gifted students performed significantly higher than the rest. Rosenthal and Jacobson referred to this as the Pygmalion effect. If you'd like to learn more about how to have high expectations for your students and what that means, check out our videos on high expectations. Number six, make the learning interesting. Sounds pretty basic, doesn't it? I once shadowed a student for for a day of classes to see what was triggering their problem behaviour. And what astonished me was not that the students were off task or difficult, but that they were attentive and compliant for so long when they were expected to sit and listen to teachers talking ad nauseum. The tasks they were asked to do were not inviting or challenging or motivating, and there was no reward for completing tasks. Much off-task behaviour and disruption could be prevented through the use of relevant, engaging curriculum and interesting pedagogy. If you consider how long you can sit still in a staff meeting or professional development and remain focused, it's not difficult to understand why students can be off-task and unmotivated. I recently heard the term three-step plan. It means taking three steps to the classroom and then start talking. Really? I'm still amazed how often I see chalk and talk lessons. When you add a social element to your lessons by allowing students to discuss, 
to work in groups, to work with other people. You're teaching them how to get along with each other, how to take turns in a conversation and how to listen respectfully to someone else's opinion, as well as working on the um, concepts that you're talking about in your lesson. Number seven, set clear expectations for your students. At the beginning of the year, it's essential to spend some time getting to know your students, setting clear expectations and developing the skills students need to work effectively in your class. The time will be well spent setting you and your students up to win the game. It'll save you time and energy later on, help your students to feel safe and calm because they know what's expected of them, and it will make your life as a teacher much more enjoyable. I recently read an article about the current Bridezilla phenomenon. The American documentary series of the same name explored what happens to seemingly normal girls once they're planning a wedding. And on the TV show, they often become uncontrollable, bullying, emotional, and use whatever means necessary to get what they want. And all this to plan what's meant to be the happiest day of their lives. One of the wedding planners was quoted as saying, the happiest brides are the ones with the fewest rules. It's the same in the classroom. The more rules you have, the more chance there is that one of your students is breaking the rules at any given time. The secret is simplicity. Keep your class rules or expectations low in number. So three to five is ideal. State them positively. So raise your hand to speak, not don't call out. And teach your students explicitly your expectations, just as you would teach any process in maths or English. Number eight, keep low-level behaviours low-level. Have you ever found yourself in the midst of a conflict with a student that began with a minor issue that blew way out of proportion and ended in the student having a meltdown, the principal being called, and perhaps the student being suspended? Many teachers have been in this situation and it's not a happy place. It can feel like things are out of control and that you're heading down a path you wish you never started. You simply ask the student to put their hat away and now there's a broken window, a cut hand, and this is not what you signed up for. Low-level behaviours require low-level responses. We all know this, right? But sometimes when you haven't had enough sleep, you've had a fight with your partner, an argument with your child, or you haven't had time for coffee, your own self-regulation skills are stretched and you may react in ways that you regret. As teachers, managing your own state is vital for maintaining positive relationships, modelling appropriate behaviour, preserving your own well-being and keeping low-level behaviours low-level. Number nine, teach your routines. Have you ever wondered why some classes always seem to know what to do and everything seems to run like clockwork? Is it because the kids are just better at organising themselves or is it something else? What it usually means is that the teacher has invested time and energy into teaching the students the routines that they need to follow in that classroom. This means that the teacher has decided on the behaviour they want to see and then has designed processes around that behaviour that will work for that particular class. Number 10. This is last, but by, cert by no means the least. Build positive relationships. Relationships at the are at the heart of everything you do as a teacher. If you think back to teachers that you had, who really, interest who really influenced you in a positive way and had an impact on your learning, you may not remember any of the content they taught you. What you will remember is the way that they treated you, how you felt in your class and the type of interactions that you had. Robert Mazzano says that students are more likely to resist following expectations when there's no relationship with the teacher. And as teachers, you have the power to influence and shape young minds. And the way that you do this is by giving them your time and energy in meaningful ways. And while you may not care about the latest rap song or computer game, you do care about your students. And when you listen to them about things they're interested in, you show them how much you care. Check out our video on how to use positive language intentionally to build relationships with your students. And check out our other videos on how to keep low-level behaviours low-level. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and happy teaching. <music>